you much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I would have loved to visit there, but uh, that's uh, the spirit of the time. Uh, so uh, today I will present you some uh, recent work uh, that uh, we did on uh, the evolution of collective properties in nested Darwinian populations. And let me start uh, by setting uh, the general framework in which uh, we pose our questions. So I guess everybody agrees that life uh, is organized in levels and these levels uh, they, some of this uh, seem to be sort of self-evident uh, and uh, what is really typical of identifying a level uh, as a, a relevant unit uh, for uh, evolution or for biological organization is that the level is uh, given uh, of uh, replication that uh, is either independent today or is believed to be, have been independent in, uh, at some point in the past. For instance, in multicellular organisms, you have cells that uh, they replicate now within the multicellular organism, but once upon a time, they were able to replicate themselves as single uh, entities. And uh, the kind of questions that people started to ask uh, now 40 years ago is, uh, how do such uh, new levels uh, emerge during uh, the history of life? And uh, how do they evolve? Uh, response uh, uh, that uh, sort of uh, encompasses uh, these two problems uh, is uh, that of uh, Darwinian individuality. So Darwinian individuals uh, are those uh, entities uh, that uh, are identified as units uh, by the fact that uh, uh, they undergo a process of evolution by natural selection. And uh, in this way, somehow, we respond both to the question of uh, how do they evolve and uh, what they are. Now, the point is to identify which are the entities that uh, uh, satisfy conditions uh, uh, for this to happen. And uh, these uh, three conditions that were identified in 1970 uh, by Lewontin uh, of uh, variation, reproduction, and heredity are considered to be the uh, necessary conditions for evolution by natural selection and therefore to be for a unit to, to be a Darwinian individual. Uh, these three conditions are sometimes uh, uh, summed up in a heritable variation of fitness uh, that uh, to me is a more problematic kind of formulation. And if you haven't read uh, this uh, paper by Doberly and colleagues uh, uh, about the concept of fitness, uh, I suggest you to read this uh, because uh, it points to one of uh, the problems that are related to recognizing new levels uh, of selection. That is basically, how do you recognize what is uh, their fitness? So their solution was uh, to Basically, you, you know what fitness is if you know what are birth and death rates, but that's not uh, really enough uh, uh, for certain cases. And this is uh, the reason why a few years ago we had proposed uh, to use uh, other criteria that are uh, in most cases equivalent to variation reproduction and heredity uh, to um, uh, to identify what are the units uh, that are subjected to natural selection. Uh, basically, you need to identify to be able to have a criterion to define what is a unit. This unit has to recur over and again in time, and there must be a genealogical structure that allows you actually to evaluate heredity. Now, why complicating matters? Actually, matters are more complicated uh, than uh, what they look like uh, if we look at uh, established uh, uh, organisms, uh, such as, uh, I don't know, our body. I mean, uh, we know what are uh, the boundaries. Uh, uh, we know what are the reproductive capacity of humans and so on. Um, but think about uh, things uh, that uh, do not really look like us. Uh, but that have properties that are more and more considered as functional. And uh, this uh, attention that has been put uh, into, for instance, uh, organisms of organisms uh, 
has been witnessed uh, lately by the use of uh, terms such as the meta-organism, superorganism, holobiont. All these are ensembles of uh, units that uh, each replicate uh, also autonomously, but that are believed uh, to have some kind of uh, um, unifying uh, function uh, uh, that can be acted upon uh, by natural selection. And the feature of all these different uh, superorganisms is that uh, they are diverse uh, collectives, uh, what I will call collectives. So they are composed of units uh, that is true, each of them replicates, uh, but they can be different from each other. Think about, I don't know, symbiosis uh, or communities, uh, uh, certain kind of aggregates, biofilms, uh, all these things, uh, we want to think that they have a function uh, at the collective level, uh, but they are not composed of genetically identical uh, units. In some sense, uh, this uh, already brings in the variation that is necessary for natural selection to act. Uh, it basically comes for free. Uh, but uh, reproduction and heredity, as I will discuss, are more uh, complicated uh, to, to get. And actually, reproduction can either come as the effect of the establishment of a life cycle. And uh, actually, I, uh, there are many papers, uh, including by some of the people present uh, at this uh, uh, seminar, about the emergence of life cycles. I take uh, the opportunity to advertise uh, our uh, new paper with uh, Leonardo Miele uh, on uh, the subject. And uh, so all this uh, recent work uh, asks actually, how does uh, reproduction at the collective level uh, get established? But one can also conceive that actually you don't really need uh, uh, to have endogenous uh, generation of uh, uh, offspring, you can also have uh, that an exogenous structure is imposed. And this is what uh, Paul Rainey and colleagues have recently called uh, a scaffold. So you impose a scaffold on a community and as a consequence, this community will behave as uh, uh, a superorganism or something that uh, goes above uh, uh, the level of cells. This scaffold uh, can be imposed uh, also in the lab, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, these are some ideas that are turning into practice more and more. Um, in this moment, uh, people want to use uh, the possibility of uh, reproducing communities in the lab uh, in order to select uh, for certain uh, properties that are property of the community. And here, so on the left is more an, an abstract view, but you can see that people around the world, and in this case, some colleagues in OSPCI here in Paris are developing machines that would allow to test in parallel lots of reactors and possibly in the future to also apply selection to these communities for a property that is a property of the community. So let's say that we have solved also the problem of reproduction. Now we somehow force uh, a reproductive uh, process or a genealogy on the collectives, even if uh, they don't initially have one. Uh, what about heredity? Is heredity trivial? Actually, if you think that uh, the reproductive process uh, involves uh, some kind of stochasticity, which uh, might be expected, especially for uh, nascent uh, uh, reproductive processes, uh, then uh, uh, the material continuity between uh, uh, one generation of collectives and the next generation might not guarantee much in terms uh, of the heredity of the function. And uh, uh, this is uh, actually the main subject of my talk. I will present you a model uh, that allows us to try and understand when does, uh, how can heredity uh, can be gained and strengthened during the course of evolution. 
so the work uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, has been uh, mainly realized by a former PhD student, Guillaume Dussier, who is going uh, to start his uh, postdoc at the University of British Columbia soon, and in collaboration with Amory Lambert at Collège de France and uh, Paul Rainey at SPCI and uh, uh, Max Planck Institute in Plum. So our view of what is a collective is very simplified. Let's say that a collective is made of parts, that uh, units that I call particles. And these particles can be of two types, a blue type and the red type. The collective as a whole has a property that is uh, the percentage of blue particles. And basically the color of the collective will be its phenotype. And uh, by acting upon this phenotype, uh, we can affect uh, the evolution of uh, collectives uh, made of these particles. But these particles, uh, they also have uh, a demography and an ecology. Now I'll present to you very schematically the kind of uh, nested populations that we will deal with. So we have a population of collectives that have different composition and therefore different color. And at this point, we can select uh, only the collectives that we like. In this case, we want collectives that are as close as possible to 50% blue and 50% red. So the, uh, the purple color collectives. So we throw away the others. And now we impose uh, a process of reproduction that in this case consists in sampling the parental uh, collective and uh, seeding a few of these particles uh, in the new collectives. And of course, here you will have uh, a variation that will be uh, larger, the larger, uh, the smaller is the bottleneck size, that is, uh, the, the more we dilute uh, the parental uh, collectives. And now that uh, we have uh, the newborn collectives, uh, we let them grow again uh, up to their adult stage. And again, at this point, we can evaluate the color and apply again selection and start a new cycle. So this is just mimicking what one would do by serial transfer in typical evolutionary uh, experimental evolution experiments. Uh, what is important in this process uh, is that there are two scales. So at the scale of uh, the collective, as I said before, there, there is a process of reproduction or dilution. And uh, to this is associated a parameter that is the bottleneck size, uh, how many particles uh, uh, seed the new generation. And uh, there is a second uh, parameter that is associated to the collective scale that is for how long uh, particles grow within a collective. And uh, this is big T, the generation, the duration of the collective generation. But then uh, inside uh, each of the collectives, uh, the particles undergo um, an ecological interaction that is uh, ruled by particle level traits. And these traits uh, can be different between blue and uh, red particles. And what we start with uh, is, uh, for simplicity, competitive interactions. Uh, we also treated more general cases, uh, but I don't have time to discuss those uh, here. So now that uh, we have uh, this process in place, we can ask the question, can the color purple man be maintained in the population of collectives? And if it can, how can we maintain it? So the first thing uh, to think about is, uh, well, maybe it just uh, gets maintained uh, just by the stochasticity of uh, um, that is involved uh, with dilution. So you might actually always maintain uh, some uh, purple colored uh, collectives, uh, but this is not true. Uh, so if you don't impose uh, any selective pressure at the level of the collectives, uh, sooner or later you will end up uh, with uh, monochromatic uh, collectives so that will be either red or blue, but uh, you won't have uh, purple ones. So the first thing to do is just to say, well, why don't I keep selecting for the good ones? And if you do so, indeed, you can 
under certain circumstances, uh, maintain forever the purple color in the population of collectives. And this mechanism has been named a stochastic correction by Salzmary and Miner Smith. Um, and uh, it has the great advantage that basically it only needs uh, stochasticity at, at, at birth uh, to keep going. But it also has some drawbacks. First of all, it doesn't always work, uh, so it can uh, crash uh, in the case uh, when populations are too small or bottlenecks too large. It is also a process with very small yield uh, because within collectives, uh, competition between uh, different types uh, will lead uh, one of the types to dominate, which means that most collectives will always uh, be different uh, from the objective. And uh, most importantly, if you take away selection, uh, you get back in the previous situation, uh, so you lose immediately the uh, target color. What happens now, what we did is that we let uh, the uh, particle level uh, uh, traits uh, to evolve. So there can be mutant uh, blue and red particles uh, with different uh, interaction and growth parameters. And what happens here is that over a long, long time, uh, what you observe is that uh, the color of the population of collectives become more and more purple. So here you have a, a distribution of the color that you see converges to the target color. And what does this mean? This means that at the end of this evolutionary process, you will have that uh, purple collectives will be the majority in the population and that they will tend to produce uh, purple offsprings with just uh, a few uh, cases uh, of outliers uh, that derive uh, from the stochasticity at birth that is always there. Remarkably, this property of having uh, a heritable purple color remains also when we take away selection. So now we have taken away selection at the level of the collective, but of course uh, uh, evolution keeps going at the level of particles. So after a while color will change, but uh, this will happen on evolutionary times and not on ecological times uh, as in the previous case. What is interesting of this uh, kind of model is that uh, we can actually go down a level and look uh, at uh, what was uh, the evolutionary path of uh, the parameters uh, of each particle type. And uh, what you observe uh, is that uh, uh, particles at the beginning, uh, they are competing with each other and uh, there will be one type that grows faster that uh, drives uh, evolution uh, by trying to, well, first of all, by becoming predominant, and then the other color will increase its growth rate to try and catch up. But as these colors, uh, both colors, uh, grow faster and faster, within the lifetime uh, that is the collective generation, uh, they will start to interact uh, and to saturate. And at this point, uh, what starts to really evolve uh, are the interaction parameters. And these interaction parameters, uh, interestingly, evolve uh, so as to be as asymmetric as possible. That is, uh, one type uh, will be basically the master and will ignore the other type, and the other type will be slaved uh, by the dynamics uh, of the first one. And uh, of course, uh, the result of this is that the color becomes uh, stable uh, on the, the right. Basically, the, each within one single collective generation, particles uh, will uh, go ecologically to an equilibrium where the two uh, colors are at 50%. So if you look at this uh, uh, ecological dynamics, uh, as I was saying at the very beginning, you have uh, one color that uh, spikes, uh, and then uh, it is selection who brings the system back to the color, color purple. Whereas in the end, uh, you have that the two colors adjust, uh, the two types adjust uh, so as to give the target color. And this is why, by the way, things uh, remain like that for a long time, because uh, the ecology of the system has been selected so as to obtain the target color. 
Okay, so we, uh, I, I showed you some stochastic simulations of these uh, nested models, uh, but uh, we can understand this uh, by some uh, uh, analytics uh, on uh, uh, simple competitive loss covalent equations uh, that um, are the deterministic approximation for the system I discussed earlier. Uh, but I don't have uh, much time uh, to go into the details. Uh, I just want to say that uh, there is uh, an easy way to see how you go from a situation where one color is dominant to a situation where uh, a mix of colors is dominant. And this uh, goes through the function uh, that associates uh, to the state of a newborn, the state of the adult collective. So if you are interested uh, to read more on this, uh, here is the paper that uh, you can read or feel free to contact me if you have any question. So just uh, for, for the end, I, I would like to keep uh, five minutes. Uh, I actually, I, I forgot to, to take uh, my watch. Uh, how, how long do I have left? Sorry. Do, do I still uh, have five minutes? Yes, 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 of course. Okay, good. So just to discuss about uh, some uh, uh, recent uh, um, uh, thinking and uh, things that are ongoing. And uh, this uh, um, uh, basically aims uh, at trying to understand how complex communities uh, can evolve. Of course, the example I just discussed was extremely simple. It was simplified because we needed something we could work on to understand the generality of this emergence of heredity in, uh, in communities, but real communities are not that simple. Uh, typically, you have lots of different entities. This time units can be OTUs, there can be functional groups. So there are many, many ways in which you can actually cluster in a real community, uh, the replicating entities that are part of it. But however you choose to cluster it, you end up usually with uh, lots and lots of different classes, uh, as you can see by the colors that are present on, on this picture. So uh, the point is, uh, how do we scale up something that uh, is uh, just valid uh, for a couple of species to something that, uh, uh, to communities that are much more complex? And uh, uh, one first question that one can ask is, uh, well, the, so the communities are very complex, but maybe the functions we are interested in are relatively simple. So people usually think about uh, communities, I don't know, planktonic communities, uh, what is really important at the level of the community? Well, I don't know, maybe primary production, uh, uh, maybe biodiversity, uh, some kind of statistics uh, that uh, actually they are above the level of each of the single species. And if one starts going in this direction, uh, then uh, you might think that actually, other properties, statistical properties that are not uh, as um, directly biologically relevant uh, could also be this related to evolutionary processes. And uh, one of these uh, properties uh, we looked at, at uh, with uh, Enrico Sergiacomi and uh, Lucie Zanger and uh, others uh, is uh, the way uh, rare species are distributed, uh, the, the abundance of rare species is distributed uh, in the planktonic communities. And what we found uh, to our surprise uh, is that uh, not only if you discard uh, very abundant or to use, uh, you end up uh, with uh, distributions that are power lows. This uh, is not universal, but uh, it happens uh, in other communities. But what's really surprised us is that uh, if you compute the quantitatively the exponent of these power laws, uh, this exponent changes very little from one place to the other in the global ocean. So we started thinking, uh, well, is this uh, something that uh, could emerge from uh, ecological or evolutionary processes? 
And so this brings me to the, my last slide about uh, what is going on in this moment. Uh, so I am uh, collaborating uh, with uh, two statistical physicists, uh, Jules Frebol, uh, who just started uh, his PhD, and uh, Giulio Biroli. Um, and uh, we are looking, uh, as uh, some other people have done before, at what happens in these virtual communities uh, when we impose a selective process uh, at the level of the community. What is uh, great uh, of uh, so the set of skills uh, that uh, Julia and Jules offer is that uh, we can actually try and understand uh, the evolutionary process uh, from a statistical viewpoint uh, in order to um, uh, see, for instance, uh, whether we expect uh, that a certain kind of uh, uh, selective pressures uh, imposed at the collective level would uh, lead the systems uh, uh, from a stability uh, uh, situation uh, to a situation where the stability is lost uh, and uh, more complicated dynamics uh, might occur. So this is uh, still uh, ongoing and uh, maybe next time we chat, uh, I have something to tell you about this. And I end uh, thanking you very much.